G'day all. It's uh, great to be with you here uh, this morning and I'll echo uh, Liz's words and just saying it does feel like home and it does feel uh, great to be able to worship uh, together this morning. And uh, hi to everyone online. That's a new thing for us. We haven't been around church while it's been online, but uh, g'day to you and yeah, g'day. <laughs> Uh, so when uh, Liz and I uh, sat down and started uh, thinking and praying about what we would share with you today, uh, we kept feeling, getting this prompting to share with you how we have been encouraged in our walk with God over this past term in Thailand. So today we'll be looking at the, uh, the Israelites crossing the Jordan, and I'll be sharing four points or four key learnings uh, that have helped me grow in my love for Jesus and my love for others. The overall theme for today is faith over fear. But first, let's uh, commit this time to prayer. Dear Lord, may your presence be felt here this morning. Open our hearts to hear the words you have for us today. May you speak to us today uh, through this story from many thousands of years ago. Amen. But first of all, uh, to start things off, Liz is actually going to come up and share a story which she'll be expanding upon throughout our uh, time together this morning. So when we first arrived back in Thailand after our first home assignment, we'd been there a couple of months and we were really praying that God would continue to lead us into the areas of ministry that he wanted us to be in. And I remember this day very clearly, I was out the back of our house and I was hanging out the washing, and I was looking out over on the same property of ours, there was another abandoned house. It looked exactly like this, just junk, cobwebs. Was, our kids actually called it the haunted house. And I was hanging the washing, looking at it, and I felt the Holy Spirit put these words on my heart that were, I will restore it and use it for my glory. And I was like, oh, the house? Okay. And so I went back inside, and I was like, God, I think, uh, Glenn, not God, <laughs> Glenn, I think God's telling us something. I think he wants us to use that house for ministry. Um, English language was always something we were doing. Teaching English was something we were doing. And so we started praying about it and sharing it with our team. But it felt a little bit risky. Um, we hadn't really done this type of programming ministry in our team before. So it felt like we were stepping out into something different to what others were doing. Also, the house not just by our kids was known as the haunted house, but in our whole village was known as the haunted house because Thais are very superstitious people. And the man that owned the house and lived there beforehand had had a very, very tragic life. And so they believed that the house had a bad spirit in it. And um, I don't know, it just felt quite risky. There was a point where we were worried that if we spent time and energy and effort restoring it, we were like, oh, would kids still come? Would parents let their kids come? Um, could God do what he said and actually use it for his glory? Would they, could he redeem it? Um, just, I don't know, we just, it was challenging. Not only that, it was the middle of COVID and kids weren't even actually going to school, let alone to after school classes. So yeah, it just felt a bit risky. So have you uh, ever been in a situation like this? Have you ever felt a strong conviction from God that he wants you to be doing something or coming alongside somebody? Maybe it's mentoring them or something like that, but that fear is crippling. Maybe it's a fear of failure. Maybe it's a fear of rejection, of a fear of embarrassment, of putting yourself out there and it just not working out. You think to yourself, I know that God wants me to be doing this, or I can see that God has this for me. I can see God leading me, but I just can't see how that could work out. There are just too many blocks in the way, too many problems. For the Israelites, they had this great, wide, big river blocking them from being where God wanted them to be. And how were they going to cross it? How could they get there? The first uh, learning that encouraged me was seeing that the Israelites had the right attitude to follow God's leading. Let's look at the first three verses of chapter 3. So early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, 
When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. The tithes, they actually have this beautiful tradition of leading. Uh, if someone is uh, moving house, maybe it's uh, just down the street, maybe it's to another village, or maybe it's even uh, across provinces, uh, there will be someone's, it'll be someone's responsibility to actually go out in front of the person that's moving to lead the way, to go before them. I still remember uh, the day that we moved from Chiang Mai, where we were living, out to Ban Luang. Uh, we were moving the family out to our first ministry location. It was a very exciting time for us. Um, and I remember our team leader, uh, Moana, coming and saying, I'm going to drive out in front of you. And I was like, Moana, that's like a five-hour car ride. You're just going to drive all the way out there for five hours and then get back in your car and drive all the way home. That doesn't make any sense to me. Why are you doing this? But he insisted. He insisted that he would drive out in front of us to make sure that we made it there safely. I was confident in my own capacity. I was quite confident that I knew how to get to Banalang. I'd been there before. Uh, and so I was like, no, you don't have to do this. But actually, in the end, I had to do it. I had to humble myself and be willing to follow uh, my team leader, Moana. To be honest, it's lucky I did because a couple of months later we found ourselves back in Chiang Mai for, uh, for a team meeting and we had to, uh, it was time to return it back out to Ban Luang. And so I put in the, into Google Maps um, our house in Ban Luang and the, it showed a slightly different path to the way that Moana had shown us the, the time before. But I was like, no, well, it's Google. Surely that knows how to get out to, out to where I need to go. And so everything was going fine a couple of hours into the trip and then uh, it took us down a turn left and a turn right and the roads just kept, kept on getting sh uh, smaller and smaller and smaller until we were going down a farm track and as you can imagine, uh, it, it stopped. We had to turn around, we couldn't get through and it ended up taking us, what, an hour and a half or two hours longer than what it should have done to get out home. So a five-hour trip turned into a seven-hour trip. Needless to say, Google Maps isn't that great out in the back blocks of Thailand. But I don't know whether it's just me, but I don't, or, or the, there's some other guys in the room that have this problem, that when we're driving and we know that we're lost, and, uh, but we're too stubborn to say anything about it, it happens to me all the time, Liz is beside me and she's like, Glenn, we're lost, you have to stop and ask someone for help. I'm like, no, 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 I know where I'm going, I know where I'm going, but uh, yes. So in the end, you ha us guys, we have to humble ourselves, take, take the pride hit and go, we don't know we're actually where we are and we actually need help in this. We need someone to lead us. Is it just me? Or is there anyone else out there that's like that? Yeah, <laughs> good to see a couple of hands. <laughs> the ark out ahead of the Israelites is a beautiful picture of God going before us, leading the way. In commanding the Israelites to follow the ark of the covenant, Really, the Israelites and us today are being told that God intends to lead and direct our lives. We just need to let him. And how do we do that? By humbling ourselves, by immersing ourselves in prayer, in the scriptures, and in meeting with our fellow believers. This term, I have really seen just how important these three things are to seeing God at work and leading. And I really do encourage you all here today to stick at, at those three things. Prayer, scriptures, and meeting with fellow believers. Immersing yourself in those will allow God to speak to you. For the Israelites, they could see God physically out ahead. It was about 900 metres, I think, out in front of them. But we don't have that, do we? We don't have an Ark of the Covenant 900 metres ahead of us. So how do we see God leading us in our lives? We see after the instruction to follow the Ark of the Covenant, Joshua instructs the Israelites to have the right attitude of expecting amazing things. When in verse uh, 5 he says, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. To consecrate yourself, uh, it means to set yourself apart for God, to move from common use to holy use. I like how uh, David Palmer puts it. He says that consecration means that I hold back my appetites or what the world would suggest to me is the good life and I take hold an appetite for God. 
it's more of God and less of me. Those three things I mentioned before, prayer, scripture, and meeting with, the, with believers, are all ways to consecrate yourself. They allow space in your life for God to shape your attitude and to lead you. More of God, more of Jesus, less of me. As we've shared, uh, part of our work in Thailand is to teach English in the local primary schools. Uh, I have to confess that there are many times that I have not enjoyed this. Uh, each week I teach uh, three classes of grades fours, fives and sixes, and they generally, um, most of them won't use English uh, in their futures. This is actually, uh, this just happened just before we came back on home assignment. This is my grade six class that has just uh, graduated grade six and are moving into high school next year. So this class, there's a f few characters in there, but on a whole, most of them are actually pretty good kids. So I, I really enjoyed teaching that class. However, <clears throat> there was one class that I had uh, a couple of years before this one that they were just absolute rat, rat bags. They, they, there was mostly boys in the class. There was one or two girls. Um, uh, and, you know, if, if you're teaching, you need the girls to sign of, uh, balance out the boys because otherwise they just go, go bonkers. But anyway, there was this one guy in this class that uh, was very, very challenging to keep under control, and he had no interest in English whatsoever. Um, and we know, most of the time that I teach... It's a little bit of English, but most of the time it's pretty much just babysitting these kids because they don't really think of English uh, too much. Yeah, so there's one guy, one boy, uh, he was about 12 years old at the time, and uh, this one particular day I was trying to run an activity and he, um, he just wouldn't listen to me, wouldn't sit down when he was supposed to be sitting down and just running around the, the classroom. It got to the point where, do you know the, um, the compasses that you use to draw circles with and they've got a little point on the end? He was getting the compass and uh, grab grabbing his, um, his classmates into a headlock and poking them in the side of their neck. And I was just like, oh, what are you doing, mate? And so yeah, I couldn't stop him because every time I went towards him, uh, he would actually get up and move to the next guy next uh, classmate. But these classmates were just sitting there and just bearing it. And sometimes you'd see little uh, tears coming down their eyes because they knew that if they moved around or thrashed around that it would just hurt too much. And so this is how out of control this guy was. And I, I got home after the teaching that day and said to Liz, I've had it. I can't do this anymore. I don't know why God has sent us to Thailand. I'm not a teacher. Why am I doing this sort of thing? Uh, I was frustrated, I was uh, exhausted, and to be honest, um, I actually probably just didn't like these kids very much. And, uh, and so it was Liz that then um, said to me at the time, she said, uh, Glenn, we're not here just to um, teach English. We're actually called here to be in Thailand to show love. These kids don't need English. They actually most desperately, all they need is love. They're not getting it at their homes. You just need to show love. I needed to change my attitude. In that, at that time, I needed to consecrate myself and trust that even though I couldn't see it at the time, that through my obedience in teaching, that God will do amazing things. So, <clears throat> rather than going to bed at night, thinking or maybe even dreading all of the things that we need to get done the next day, or the kids that we need to teach, or the uh, workmates that we have to work alongside. What would it look like going to bed thinking, tomorrow God's going to do amazing things? Less of us, more of him. So firstly, uh, the Israelites, they had the right attitude. And secondly, the Israelites had the right action by taking steps of faith. So while they were keeping their eyes on the Ark of the Covenant, uh, we see the Israelites follow behind the priests until they reach the Jordan River. And then we read in verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. So there's this big pile of water. God wants to include us in his work and loves to see our faith put into action. 
In taking a step of faith into the water, God allowed the water to, to pile up. <clears throat> Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith by stating, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is assurance about what we do not see. The emphasis here is on the we, isn't it? What we do not see, but the one that leading us does. Faith is about trusting the God who leads, trusting him and what he can see over what we can see. <clears throat> God instructed action, action that showed faith in him. True faith gets its feet wet rather than sitting back and waiting for God to show up. So uh, as Liz said, I'm just going to um, continue the story on a little bit. Starting a ministry in the house next door did seem a little bit risky. We hoped it would go well, but were we confident? Probably not, to be honest. Could we see what it would look like? Not really, other than knowing that, uh, that word from God, that he would restore it for his glory. But as you saw in the video, we decided that we had to trust in God. Uh, we started by getting our feet wet, so to speak. We convinced the owner to rent us, which was quite challenging at the time. Uh, then we got to work cleaning, painting and fixing it up. We were physically restoring it. We also worshipped and prayed throughout uh, the, the area, the, the land and the building uh, to, to Jesus at that time, ensuring the house was, uh, was spiritually restored. We got everything ready so that when COVID had subsided, we could advertise and get the classes started. To be honest, it actually all went pretty smoothly. At the end of the first day of teaching, uh, as, as Liz and I reflected about how it all went, we were amazed that it was just so much better and so much bigger than what we could have imagined. We could see that it was only God that could have made that happen. We need to come to a place where our trust in God is greater than our trust in ourselves. We need to have a faith in God that takes the first step. We need to have assurance about what we do not see. So thirdly, thirdly, we're called to have a right posture, one of standing firm. So back to the story. Uh, so the water piles up some great distance away, and then in verse 17 we read, The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Later on in chapter 4, it actually says that the Israelites hurried over, and I don't blame them. I don't, I don't know about you, but if, I could, if there was a huge pile of water just a, a little while away that was con probably continuing to pile up, wouldn't you just want to like, try and get by the, the river as fast as possible? But what did the priests do? They stood firm in the middle. They had the right posture. They had to trust God that the waters wouldn't crash down around them. They had to trust God that this was the right time to be standing still, standing firm, knowing at this time God wanted them where they were. Sometimes it can be scary being led by God into places we haven't been, as, as the Israelites were. But sometimes it can actually be just as scary staying still, knowing that it's only God's presence that is keeping you from being swept down a river. We fear that God won't show up. We need to have faith over fear. This is now just going to come up and continue on her story. So as Glenn shared, it was all going pretty well. Um, but then we started to hit some bumps in the road, I guess. I don't know if God had done such a good job at restoring the building, but all of a sudden people in our village were showing up and asking us about how they could buy the building. And we were like, what? Hang on a minute. I thought, you, you know, this is the scary house. So that would, it was redeemed and they all wanted it. It became this hot commodity. And the problem was is that we were fearful that if somebody bought it and they wanted to live in it, which is most likely in the, the area that we live in, we wouldn't be able to rent it anymore and use it for what God had called us to use it for. So we were like, God, no, don't let it get taken away from us. Um, and we just had to trust that he was going to provide. Um, then one of our boys started having some pretty significant health issues. Um, there were a couple of months where we were just 
trying to figure out what was going on. And it was a very stressful, very um, confusing time navigating all of that with specialists and different people, tests, MRIs, x-rays, all that kind of stuff in a second language for him and for us. Um, and yeah, it was really confusing. And then the challenge of treatment and the best type of treatment, it went on for quite a few months. Um, and to be honest, we were discouraged, tired, stressed. Um, there was definitely a point where we considered maybe it was better for us to move back here and find a doctor here and just to make sure that he would be okay. And we remember the day that we were like, Lord, we, we want to be here. We're happy with what's going on. The ministry, we're excited to be a part of this work that you've called us to, you've led to. We just need you. We need, to, we need your help. And thankfully, um, to this day, we are still renting that house and we have the project with the idea to buy it so that we'll never lose it. <laughs> um, and also, we were able to find a really amazing specialist for our son. She, lives, uh, she works about three hours from where we live. So we do travel to see her, but she's taken our family in and really walked alongside us to provide the best care possible for him. So we were grateful God um, showed up for us in that, in that way. Yeah, I remember being in that state of, uh, of confusion going, why God, why have you called us here? And then things are just starting to go wrong. Having the right posture can mean standing in that place of confusion and uncertainty just as tr- uh, and just trusting that God has led you there and that he hasn't left you. If this is you, uh, if you can resonate with this, I really do encourage you this morning to stand firm. Sometimes the easy thing in ministry is just to keep trying new things, and it can be hard to stand firm, knowing that you are where God wants you to be. Stand firm and find people around you to support you. Okay, so let's review. Firstly, we have to have the right attitude of following God's leading and expecting amazing things. We also have to have the right action of taking steps of faith. And thirdly, we need to have the right posture of standing firm. Finally, our faith is to have the right perspective Sorry, by remembering and testifying. So we see after the Israelites have actually crossed the Jordan River that a really important event happens. In chapter 4, verse 8, we read... So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that, he had, been, that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. And then skipping down to verse 21. He said to the Israelites... In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. What did the Israelites do when they were crossing the river, when they were in the middle? They collected stones that were used as a memorial, as a sign of what God had done to them for them that day. Remembering what God has done in our lives helps us in our future. It realigns our expectations of seeing God work in us and through us. The act of remembrance changes us. We become expectant. It makes that next step of faith easier. It makes us less fearful that we are only doing this by ourselves. Our confidence grows and grows that God is with us. Liz is now going to come off and finish up her story. So while we've been walking this journey in the last few years in Thailand, it feels like we've sort of been collecting stones of our own, of remembrance of what God has done for us. Um, Sorry. 
don't worry about it. I wanted to share with you that this young lady here, the one sitting closest to the, at the end of the table, she's a 20-year-old young girl and she's actually our neighbour. She lives in the house right next door and she is excellent at English. So in the last three years, she's been studying English at school and then went on to university to study it as well. And over the past few years, because she's so interested in learning, she would just come and hang out in our house and while I was cooking dinner, she'd practice words and, and we'd just chat and she'd play with the kids and just kind of hanging out whenever she was home. She'd always be there. On Saturday morning, she'd come and teach some English with us as well. And it was just really fun hanging out with her. She's a great girl. Um, and just a couple of weeks before we returned to Australia, she was over at Bansawang with me helping pack up some of the toys but to shut it up. And she said to me, uh, Teacher Gulao or Kugulap, I don't really understand why you're not scared of things in your life. And I was like, okay. She's like, yeah, I think she's referring to the, the spirits in the house and the fact that our child had been sick, which she understood. Um, and, and she just said, yeah, I don't understand why you're not scared of things. And I said, well, I mean, I am. I am scared of things sometimes. But in the Bible, it teaches us that we can pray to Jesus and that he will give us peace. And I just said to her, um, you know, when I get scared, I just simply pray to Jesus and ask him to lead me what to do next and ask for his peace. And then I just said to her, like, what do you do when you're scared? I mean, she's young. She's, on, she's still kind of a teenager. And she was like, um, I just turn the music up really loud and try not to think about it. And I was like, yeah, okay. Um, and I'm like, does that work? And she's like, mm, not, not really. And so then I said to her, well, you know, Jesus isn't just for me or our family. He's for, he came to, you know, for everybody. And so if you're scared or you have something you want to pray about, you can pray to Jesus as well. And she said, yeah, I think I'm going to need to do that. And then um, a few, few seconds passed and she goes, yeah, but if I do, can I pray in Thai? Because in English is so hard. <laughs> and I was like, you can pray in Thai. He understands that too, <laughs> better than me. <laughs> so I guess it's just, been, it's just been kind of a testimony for us, an encouragement to us that as we've walked alongside people and they've seen us walking through the trials of, of our own lives, um, that they've been able to see, and, and it's been a testimony to who Jesus is and our faith in him over fear. <clears throat> yeah, I'm really uh, excited. That happened not, not, not too long before we came back, and so we feel like God's got, us, got things waiting for us on our return back to Thailand, and I'm really excited for that. <laughs> Uh, it's that last verse, isn't it, that's, that's key, I think, for this whole passage. It tells us why this crossing of the Jordan happened. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. He is powerful, isn't he? And that's the testament that we have for um, our, our neighbour back in Thailand, that God, that Jesus is all powerful over everything on this earth. I really want this morning to be an encouragement to you, an encouragement to continue to love Jesus and love others, an encouragement to see God, to see Jesus and follow Him and His leading, an encouragement that you can uh, expect God to show up when you get your feet wet. An encouragement to stick it out when things get tough. And I really want to encourage you to talk to others about the good things that God is doing in and around you. As we follow the example of the Israelites, we can be assured that through us and among us, that the Lord Jesus will do amazing things.